Hey guys, welcome back to Real Talk with Renisha. I'm Renisha, your host. And today we are going to be talking to another amazing guest. He's an entrepreneur, an author, dancer, and founder of Ray Hodge Consulting, where he is a business consultant. He is hailing all the way from the land down under, also known as Australia. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Ray Hodge. Welcome, Ray. Thanks, Rennie. Good to uh, be here. I am so glad you're here. The one thing I forgot in the, in the intro is like that for the last eight years, I've also been privileged to call him a friend because you have inspired me along my journey. And this is why you're here, because I want you to be able to inspire others on yours. So thank yes, you for thank taking you. the time to be here with us today. On Real you're Talk. welcome. I've been looking forward to it. Oh, excellent. That means we're going to have an amazing show. And I'm excited to begin diving into these questions here with um, Ray. So first of all, Ray, um, tell us a little bit about your company. You're the founder and creator of Ray Hodge consultant where you are a business consultant tell us a little bit about what your day-to-day -day, um job is like oh my day today well i work uh, a lot in business uh, process improvement uh, leadership development and executive coaching so day-to-day -day, it varies but it's client work writing marketing essentially that's it i've been doing it for about 13 years and have worked with uh, small companies in the bush through the multinationals and uh, prime minister and cabinet at one stage and numerous companies, much in between. And a lot of my work currently is the, in the construction, industrial, civil uh, industry sectors. So yes, it's quite varied, but I, I love what I do and I love the challenge of it. I, it's one thing about my work that I, it, I never get bored in it because there's always something that's stretching me, somebody or or some company improvement. So, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about these challenges. But what would you say led you to become a, to become a consultant, a business consultant? What was there like the driving force for you to start your own company? Well, it's interesting back. I, I ran a finance business before this company and I had a business coach at that time. I've had coaches myself over the years. I'm a big believer in it. Nice. And he, he helped me identify about three years into that finance business that my future career was in coaching and consulting. And I had planned it for about, in my, you know, plan, I'd forecast it for seven years time. Okay. And I remember meeting with another business coach, very successful guy in Melbourne one time over lunch. And it was one of those moments where the clouds cleared. And I'm, I, I thought now is the time. So I came back home and within two weeks started coaching, consulting, still ran my finance business, but pretty much it was an overnight decision and got straight into it. Awesome. You know, there's a saying, you know, when you know, and that I think was in that exactly. yes, it, like the light bulb came on and you knew, oh my gosh, this yep. is really where I'm supposed to be. And here you yeah, are. Yeah. And I've, I've loved it. It's uh, yeah. I, don't want to do anything else so it's a very satisfying job do you know how rare it is to hear someone nowadays talk about they love their job and how satisfying <laughs> that is that is so rare to hear so i'm just excited to think to know more about this that you've actually have said that because it's very far and few in between and I'm speaking from listening to my clients listening to my friends and people just complain daily about their jobs so that's great to hear yeah awesome yeah. So you talked a little bit about the challenging what some of the challenging moments do you have in in your field well, one of the one of the things I really enjoy working at 
uh, with people is that everyone is different. If I do process improvement, it's, you know, I, I map workflows, find where the blockages are, straighten them out. And you're pretty much guaranteed of uh, the results as you do that. But when you I'm working with people, as you would know in your field, the variables are numerous. And even within the one person, I'm speaking about even about myself, the variables shift um, pretty constantly. So... I, I really enjoy that aspect of it, of yeah, the challenge of working with people, tapping into their uh, internal drivers, what motivates them, uh, the conditions that they live within, uh, both personally and at work, and shifting those, changing those. So that's probably the the key thing that I love about working with people is it's just everyone's different and every day is different. Exactly. People are unpredictable. <laughs> Everyone brings their own uniqueness to your yeah. job, to my office, and you get to work around that. But it is it is very interesting because if you were to work with people who are like us, it would be boring. So it's nice yeah. to have that mixed bag, I think. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the work I, I do is uh, with larger companies uh, these days. And a lot of the stress and overwhelm that a lot of managers that I work with, that's very obvious. And so helping people still maintain their workloads, increase their performance and productivity and decreasing their stress and overwhelm. And that's a really nice mix to be able to, to work with. Yes. I find that for what I've been seeing and hearing on my end is that most people in the job market really feel that they're not valued. And I've heard it over and over again. If my manager, if my supervisor was to just give me a word of encouragement, would just say, great job. Thank you for doing X, Y, Z. It would mean the world to them. Is that yeah. something that you also teach or coach? Definitely. Yeah. It's the, the simple things of thank you. And like you said, great job. It's I've studied a fair bit into the whole behaviorism side of it over the time. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the power of reinforcement. And so the great job and also feedback, giving instruction as to how people could do better, but always having that in encouragement and being personable I think too as managers uh, is really important so. I always feel like managers should have a personality and maybe because I know I have a big personality I feel <laughs> you're supposed to have a certain kind of personality while you're out there dealing and working with people daily is that kind of is that accurate well I think that I think from my perspective the most important aspect is managers to be personal no matter what personality they've got but if they're personable mm -hmm. and they take an interest in their people that shows that they're valuing them and they can actually get more out of their people once people feel valued because if I feel valued by my manager and he gives me or she gives me instruction mm -hmm. or feedback I can take that in the context of being valued, yes. if that makes sense. Whereas if I don't feel valued and I just feel the manager's just on my ass all the time, it's, you know, I don't, I don't move as fast or even really want to. But if I'm valued, a whole different story. It seems so easy, right? It seems so easy to say, and yet so many fail at this, but it oh. seems so, so easy. I'm so glad that they have you out there to help to remind them <laughs> the, things, the little things that as human, human beings, we want, we appreciate, and we value. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. So that said, what do you really love about it? Is the encouragement part? Is it seeing growth? What do you love about what you do daily? I see the thing that one of the things that drives me in my business is an underlying 
premise of making leaders' lives easier. Mm. So whether that's business process improvement or whether it's personnel improvement, leadership development, exec coaching, seeing people ease up. And I, I work with a lot of people on the stress edge, overwhelmed too much on. So just seeing people lighten up, get res the results thereafter, solutions to some of the challenges that they're working through, all of those things are just incredibly satisfying. It's like I come away from, you know, meetings and jobs thinking, like I said, love my job. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say it's probably more like, I don't know for every therapist, but from for me personally is I love working with clients and then I can see growth over several weeks, um, a couple of months. I can see growth. They, they are demonstrating growth to me. That's when I feel great about the job that I'm doing because I feel like, okay, yes, I'm really making a difference for that person and I'm actually seeing the growth in them, you know, throughout yeah. the months, the weeks and months. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've worked with people for, you know, a couple of days through to, I was talking to someone yesterday I've probably worked with for about seven or eight years, just on and off, just in their business and with their different people and with them. And yeah, you see, you know, that person was working 80 hour plus weeks when I first started. And you just see that that change in the, you know, becoming more deliberate, not as reactive, more methodical in their management of the business. And I love that. And the personal changes that they go through as well. Because what you're doing, Ray, is not just for business. It is for that personal person's challenge and that personal person's life either. Because whatever we do, whether it's for us or for others, it does change us. So whatever you're teaching them or whatever they're learning, yeah, they're bringing it to their companies and their offices, but they're also bringing it home as well. At least I hope so. Yeah. 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 I've I've had I've had a lot of people say that their, you know, their partner's a whole lot happier since we started working together, which is really cool, you know. It's like <laughs> you like a partner who's less uptight and demanding yeah. <laughs> for sure <laughs> that's great so you're kind of like doing therapy in your own way yeah which yeah. I for all therapists to some extent right <laughs> yeah 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 that's right yeah okay so moving right along your bio also says that you are an author can you tell us about your publications so I, well, on a weekly basis, I write a small piece. I think you're on that list, Mindful Motivation. So that's uh, that's a weekly piece I write. Uh, I write articles, they get published. And then I've authored three books and I've got another one uh, in the wings at the moment. So, and that one's a heavy lift. So... So yeah, it's it's that's one of the more challenging aspects of my day writing and wrestling with research and trying to make sense of you know, for example, the whole topic of motivation that I I've been working through for the last couple of years and where it intersects with behaviorism and just wrestling with a you know the whole concept at the moment of consequences punishment and reward and so just a lot of that and then writing out it's yeah it's it's a wrestle but it's wow in a same way rewarding so what inspires you to write and when do you find time to write i know you're very busy so when do you actually find time or do you cut that out in your day to do that? How do you set aside time to write? So this comes into different aspects of my world, but the last few years, I've my eyes automatically open. At the moment, it's 3.40 every morning. It was 3.41 this morning. <laughs> and I have I have I have learned that if I if my feet can hit the floor when my eyes first open, uh, it supercharges my day. And that's when I write from essentially four to seven, read, uh, research. So that's typically how I do it. So, and, and I should also say a lot of times I'm not inspired to write. I'm probably rarely inspired to write. It's just a daily discipline. And I think someone said, you know, inspiration finds the person who's working 
So I don't go looking for it. <laughs> that is amazing. Now, are you saying that's 3.40 a.m.? A.m. A.m. Oh, yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Well, it's I been as early as 2. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's been as early as 2 a.m., but generally it's around the 4 a.m. 4 a.m. mark, so... So what I'm hearing is true dedication. You can only have true commitment and dedication to wake up at that time of the day to begin writing. That is yeah, well, the, the the discipline is getting my feet from the bed onto the floor. And once I'm fine, and, and so my coffee machine turns itself on at quarter to three. So... You know, I've I've built some little little things into the process to wow. help me get. Home. <laughs> but you, you you know what I'm what I'm taking from all of this is nothing happens by chance. I'm hearing that nothing happens by chance. Chance for you to start writing said you're on your third book. No, Fourth, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's not it's not by chance that this is happening. You're actually making it happen doesn't happen by chance because as you said at 3 40 in the morning i know for me my feet will not be leaving the bed <laughs> it just doesn't at 3 40 anywhere right but of course if that was what i truly wanted to do i feel like even i can dedicate myself to that very mm. difficult the struggles like you said very very difficult but nonetheless can make it happen so it's what we put our minds to that's where I'm going with this. But what we put our minds to is what I'm yeah. hearing here. It can't happen. Yeah. And also working with our personal rhythms. You know, I used to be a night owl and I'd be on a dance floor still at 4 a.m. <laughs> Whereas now, <laughs> now I'm, yeah, that's right. And, and now I'm at my desk at, you know, 4 a.m. Uh, writing. So it's, yeah, things have changed and, um, but it's good. And I think the other reward for me in it is that it activates my brain, supercharges me. So when I'm with clients through the day, I'm I'm much more alert than if I sleep until, you know, seven o'clock in the morning. So that it's a little reward in that process for me as well. That is awesome because 7 a.m. again, it's not sleeping, it's sleeping. <laughs> I get it. So, so get the dedication of your heart. And that again is what has propelled you to where you are because again, it's not happening by chance. So, speaking on the whole notion of struggles in your bio, you also mentioned that you have struggled with depression in the past. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was for you? Uh, well, it came about uh, through a, a whole series of losses. And when I talked to my therapist at the time and I rattled all of those off, she's like, that's a lot of loss. <laughs> and uh, it just caught up with me in the end. I, you know, you try to keep going and try to, you know, in my terms, man up and, and uh, be strong. And then it was an overnight a thing that just nailed me and I yeah I went into six weeks of dark it was just pretty black uh, didn't want to go outside the house self-loathing a whole lot of shit that just came down the pipe overnight and through that time I I just said to myself that if I can make my bed clean the dishes and show up at my desk every day that they were the three things I, I I made sure I did in those days I didn't want to be around anyone I didn't want you know anything and I still had client work on at the time which was really helpful but yeah it was just a really black period uh in that in that six six weeks I called it my bridge jumping territory like it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't pretty at all. So, depression never is because we call it the black hole, right? But yeah. what I what I applaud you for is that you were able to reach out and ask for help. And you said, "I just needed to man up," and I feel like that's just such a masculine <laughs> term 
Because yeah. men don't really ask for help. So oh, tell yeah. us, being a man, knowing that you are the price, knowing that you're in this dark place, what triggered you? What propelled you to say, you know what? I cannot handle this on my own. Let me reach out and ask for help. Yeah, it's tricky because in depression and I still go through it like it's, you know, from time to time, it's not like I it's even though that black period, I still go through it at times and everything within me wants to not reach out, wants to isolate, wants to, you know, yeah, isolate and but I think I learned along the way that even if it's just some kind of connection with somebody that I can, you know, be a hundred percent myself with. And that was the key thing was just finding some people who, you know, it was okay. When I went and saw my psychologist at the time, I thought, I always thought to myself, I'm going to be a hundred percent honest because I'm paying her and I'm leaving you know, all my shit in her office <laughs> and uh, I can just be totally myself. And I, I found that really, really helpful. So, and it's not easy. It's not easy to reach out, not easy to pick up the phone and call someone and say you're struggling, but it's a really important aspect of just doing the journey. So. It is the first step. And, you know, I do applaud potential clients, right? The ones who just literally sent me an email or the ones who literally um, call, I, I applaud them. I said, thank you so much for taking that first step to reach mm-hmm. out because I understand how difficult that is. Just, just being vulnerable and saying, yeah, I'm calling because I have a problem. Yeah. I'm calling because I can't cope. You know, as, as, as a therapist, we understand that that first step is the hardest step. It really is the hardest step. And of course, if you're, the, if you're the person who has not been able to find that right match and fit for a therapist, there's going to be many other first time, first steps doing that. But once yeah. you have found that right right fit, it's almost magical for that individual. Mm-hmm. So I applaud you for, again, as a male, <laughs> taking that same thing. Like, I need help. I cannot do this on my own and reaching out to get, to, to get the help that you need. Tell, tell us a little bit about how going through depression, having that entire experience has shaped you to who you are today. I think it's made me more self-aware. Mm-hmm. That's been one of the things that's come out of it, to be kind to myself. Yes. And to exercise more self-care. Like even when I talk about the writing in the mornings, yes. that that really helps activate everything within me to, to be uh, much more inspired. So depression, you know, <laughs> stripped, for me, stripped out the inspiration, whereas I find that writing, reading, research time is just one of those things that, that really helped so in some senses it was quite formative in that and it also helps me in my work now Mm -hmm. so that when I'm meeting with people uh even though I you know everyone's experience is different but I have some sense of being able to do a journey with them even if I'm not in their shoes right you know, and I've learned that empathy means the whole aspect of uh, in feeling, you know, feeling into. And so, you know, like yesterday, I, I talked to a homeless guy on the street and shouted in lunch. And now I've never been homeless, but yeah, it's just helped me not be judgmental and to be okay in all of those situations. I worked with a girl a while back who was having some severe panic attacks at work. And so, again, that depression and my own struggle with, you know, anxiety and different things, it tunes me in a little bit more. So it's it's been helpful on many fronts. Yes. 
You are correct. And one of the most important things that you said is being self-aware. It's being self-aware to just kind of know that any one of us can be susceptible to any kind of mental illness because life has a way of just doing things to us sometimes that we have no control over. Yeah. We, into that. we become anxious. We Other things can happen to us that we didn't necessarily, you know, ask for. But like you said, for you, it was a lot of losses. And that is a yeah. huge trigger, of course, um, for depression. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting, Rennie. I'm um I was asked to be be an ambassador for uh the Master Builders uh association here in South Australia uh for a new mental health program called Rise that they've established. So it's a free service for everyone in the construction industry. Suicide rates in the construction industry are quite high in Australia. And so that, you know, even that people can book in free service and it's great when people phone and they they share their journey and and again just having been there has um, opened up some of those kind of avenues so well the best kind of teacher mentor or therapist are the ones who've actually walked in the shoes of that person because mm -hmm. then it's like really you really understand where they're coming from but i did not realize that there was a high suicidal rate in construction workers. What's yeah, that? I don't, I can't remember the actual statistic, but it's significant enough that there's organisations. There's one called Mates in Construction, and that's really training people in the construction uh, industry and in businesses to be attuned to others and ask. Here in Australia, we have I don't know about uh, in the US, we have um, the a, a day. Uh, called are you okay day oh, i love that so it's just yeah so it's just reinforcing that whole thing of looking out for your mates and saying are you okay so yeah it's quite uh quite significant what's what's happening on that front very interesting so over the summer i went to a barbecue and there was this kid he must have been about 10 and he had on this cool t-shirt that says it's okay to not be okay. And I'm just yeah. like, oh my gosh, that is so cool. Obviously his parent brought it for him, right? But I'm like, I want that t-shirt because it is okay to not be okay. It's all right. Yeah. Wow, that was that was great to see. But oh my gosh, I, I can, did not realize that um, mm -hmm. construction works. Like, I guess there are certain fields, I would say that does lead to a higher prevalence of suicide, but... I would never think a construction worker would be more prone to suicide. Just, it just didn't yeah. really work in my head at all. So it's yeah. interesting to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Um, another side question. What is there a stigma or is mental health a huge stigma in Australia as it is here in the US? I'm not really sure. I think it's certainly changing through education. So I think it has been in the past. Um, but now, I don't know, uh, probably a lot of people would say yes. It's just I live I live in that world with, you know, clients and I'm talking about it all the time and I share my own journey. So yeah. <laughs> I don't... Uh, I don't really know. There is still a, the Aussie, uh, you know, man up, um, you know, harden up. Uh, there's still that kind of aspect around, but I think it's I think it's changing overall, which is which is great. I hope so. I really hope so. I mean, are you finding that you're hearing a lot of people talking about? Yeah, I have a therapist. Yeah, I've been to therapy. Yeah, I go to therapy. Is that something that's like kind of normal? In yeah. conversation. Well, I don't know if it's normal, but you certainly <laughs> certainly hear it. And and it's, it's probably to in part because I share my own journey. And so when I share my journey, people are more able to open up with their journey. And that's been one of the gifts. So. Absolutely. Because people think, oh my gosh, am I the only one that's going through this? Am I the only one who have gone through this? And then when someone like you opens up, they're like, oh. No, he has, and I have too, and it's okay. Yeah. I can share. Awesome, 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 awesome. I love that. 
Okay, moving on. So clearly you have been to therapy. You said you've had coaches in the past. And I want to I want to say that therapy worked for you. What can you tell us about therapy and should everyone, or not everyone, but should most of us, whether we're going through depression, the label or not, have a therapist? Well, I, th I think, um, I just think it's good to have someone to talk to. And whether they give you any help or not, just having someone do the journey with you and and simply listening, and, you know, that can be a friend, but somebody who can hold the space for you, I guess. And yes. one of the things that was really helpful with the psychologist I saw was she was very practical, and I'm a practical kind of guy. So she could, you know, two or three things to a to-do list for the week that, that I had to, to come out and, and report back, you know, in a sense, you know, a bit of a coach. And that was really helpful. You know, she didn't deep dive into my childhood and, you know, and the womb experience or anything like that. She, uh, she just dealt with, you know, um, she dealt with where I was at. She would always ask me, uh, if I was, because I was uh, suicidal through part of that time, she would always ask me, are you planning it? That was her one thing she always asked, are you planning it? How are you going? And I said, I remember one time I said to her, I said, I said, no, I'm not planning it, but floating, jumping off a bridge and floating dead down the river sure is a comforting thought. <laughs> Wow. But I'm not planning. Now it's funny now, but at the time it was uh yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great. So so she was great. It was just straight in my face and gentle, but straight. So you were one of the lucky ones to find an amazing psychologist or therapist during that dark time in your life. So again, a lot of people struggle with us finding that right fit. Um, and of course, she was just trying to make sure that you were in a safe place especially once the session is over, we got to make sure that our, our clients are safe. So we yeah. were to next time. So that was great that she asked that question when she saw you, because she wanted to that you were going to be in a safe place once you got, once you left the office. Now, how did you envision your life during, let's say your depression? Because we, we know where you are right now. Yeah. What well, were apart, from, like, <laughs> apart from uh, floating dead down a river, um, uh, I really didn't, I really didn't see, yeah. well, I, I, I couldn't see out of that black hole to start with. Yes. And then as I was, uh, got going, so I went through a marriage separation that ended up in divorce. So that changed the, the nature and the course, mm -hmm. course of life as well through that whole period. Yeah. So yeah, it's, um, it's just been, a yeah a move a move and groove really um you know since that time and then i was on a, a plane uh flying into adelaide at one stage and got talking to the uh, woman beside me who was a psychologist <laughs> we changed numbers for professional reasons <laughs> and i just kept flying back to adelaide and, and she's my partner so it's really cool uh living with now sharing life with the psychologist as well so she's very helpful in so many respects with my client work as well so anyway i probably sidetracked got off track there but anyway it's all <laughs> that's why i love this conversation because we can go off topic but it really isn't <laughs> so you, you are one of these years later having to deal with your battles and struggles with depression and now you are partnered with a psychologist that's amazing yeah. that's a great story <laughs> Better, the way you met her and I've heard this story before and I think it's absolutely amazing so for all the single people out there who think that you can't meet anyone organically Ray's here to say yes you can absolutely yep. you can just be open you never know who's sitting next to you on an right and, and the funny thing the funny thing was is we met in the back row of a virgin flight and then 12 months later, I proposed in the front row of the Virgin flight, going back the opposite way. <laughs> oh my God, absolutely love it. Wow. On the back row to the front row. Absolutely love it. But 
love can happen at any time and anywhere. You just got to be open to it. I absolutely love that. Thanks for sharing that. Completely not in the script, but again, <laughs> that's this right. is script. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Okay. What would you say are aspects of your life that are still in progress? Aspects of my life that are still in progress? After oh everything my God. that you've been through everything. thus far, thus far, because life continues. Yeah, I, I'm, I think, gosh, I feel like everything's still growing and I'm still learning, whether it's in my work, uh, in my reading, uh, whether it comes down to cooking, you know, or dancing. I'm, I'm still always trying to learn new things and be better and uh, in every aspect. So depression still gets me and anxiety at times. Um, and so just, you know, just learning to do those little journeys, um, you know, it, to be okay, not being okay. And just doing those things never nails me like it did, but you know, it's, everything's in progress. <laughs> I don't feel like I've, I've mastered really anything. So, and I like, I like life to be like that. Yes. Because you know what? We're never comfortable. We always know there's more to do. There's more growing that will take place. Because again, you're open to because nothing is really set in stone or done. And you know, just to, just to piggyback a little bit on you saying, I still get depressed. So we're talking to someone who has been depressed, who has gotten treatment for the press, who I'm, I'm, who I'm sure has tons of tools in the toolbox when it comes to depression, but nonetheless, every so often still gets depressed because that's, mm. that, that's what life is. Yeah. Because real yeah. living being things are always going to come our way that sometimes we can't handle that might make us feel down, that might make us yeah. feel sad, that might make us feel hopeless, but it doesn't mean that that's the end of it. So yeah. I love saying, yeah, I still get depressed, even though I've conquered it to a certain extent, Every once in a while, I still go there. It's an ongoing thing. Yeah, yeah. Some, sometimes, and some sometimes, and as with anxiety as well, I can't sometimes even locate a cause because I'm pretty big into cause and effect with the whole variable side of things, independent, dependent. But sometimes I can't locate that. Some Sometimes uh, days I've, I've felt like a big wet blanket's been thrown over the inside of me. So, you know, one of the little tools I have for all of that is being okay with not being okay and just thinking, you know, this will pass. I've just got to ride the waves, be kind to myself. And love so it. ongoing journey. <laughs> Yes, love it. Because there are days that you're going to get up and you just don't feel good. Yeah. Yourself. Literally, it happens literally. So, yes, yeah. yes. And I don't know for you, Um, I know like in here in the States, in New York, where I am, we recently changed our clocks back. So with that said, it gets darker earlier. So like 4.30, it's, it's like almost pitch black. And a lot of people suffer from seasonal affective disorder. And that's one of the reasons why. Wow. So in winter time, it's darker earlier and it's colder. People struggle with that. Just that people struggle with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm weird. I just like the cold and the dark. So I'm, I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are weird. We <laughs> 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 like the cold. <laughs> Although I know that it's becoming summer where you are, though, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. and we're getting winter. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what does self-care look like to you? I really, I add it to every single guest, and I know you're an advocate of self-care. So what does self-care look like um, for you, Ray? Uh, well, a few things, simple things, uh, making sure I, I get a decent sleep. So... Strangely enough, getting up early, um, I've kind of learned uh, where that um, sweet spot is for sleep. Uh, I journal most days, and I've done that for probably about 40 years. So I'm really old. So, <laughs> so I, I write 
pretty much every day I write you know what happened yesterday about life and uh, how I'm feeling especially so that's a that's so on the top uh, top shelf of my book case here there's a, a massive amount of journals from all the years so I can read back and reflect so reflections part of that uh, and just making sure I'm switching off from work so I've got pretty large capacity to work a lot of hours so just making sure I'm not overworking uh, I get out on a dance floor with Michelle at times go out for lunch and you know I I cook uh, do a fair bit of cooking now these days gardens so just different things just to switch the brain off but and the interesting thing is is that i've learned that switching the brain off in those activities i'm i'm starting to rely more on the resting brain and the, the subconscious and what it actually brings up insights into my work with people so it's a it's actually a productive exercise so that's a bit of self-care great the simple things i love it mm. the simple things the simple things in life that a lot of it is free, quote unquote, that you can enjoy. But I love to journal in because it's definitely one of the coping skills that we tell clients you should journal. Because like you said, I can reflect two years, five years, 10 years down the road, I can reflect on who and what I was 10 years ago and laugh. Mm. Because clearly, hopefully we have grown so much in that time frame. <laughs> yeah. You laugh at yourself in those moments. But yeah. just great to just have a, 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 a place to go back and see who and where you are, you know, several years ago. So I love the journaling part of it. Tell yeah. us about your dancing. I completely forgot that you were a dancer. Tell us about your dance. I think it's, it's very, very, very interesting. Well, I, I always start by telling people that I'm not very good. I'm not very good, but I have a shitload of fun. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I'd always um I'd always wanted to dance and I remember uh it was after I was separated and a woman asked me to dance I was watching a band a woman came up to dance and I I held on to the bar for dear life and said no thank you and I it was at that moment I thought I'm going to go and learn so I enrolled in ballroom lessons then the following week uh learned that for about six months my dance teacher used to wear steel cap stilettos that's pretty cool. Wow. So uh, when I stood on a toes, so I didn't get in trouble. And and then I I learned swing dancing. And interestingly, Michelle, my partner, she comes from a, ta a tango background. So now we get out on dance floors and it might be a club with 18-year-olds, you know, and we'll, we just mix it up and go freestyle and do some of the ballroom stuff and yeah it's it's fun so and I'm always making mistakes but like I said it's just fun it's so much fun it's like number one coping skill you're having fun it's about self-care your partner is into it she absolutely loves it I mean it doesn't get better than that no and, and we we will often dance we will often dance on the street if we're walking along and we hear music coming out, and sometimes even when there hasn't been music, we've given dance lessons on the street outside of, you know. So it's kind of just a yeah, very fluid, fun type of thing for us to do. So I really feel that from hearing your story and knowing where you come from, the background, I know you a little bit as well, that just hearing you say that, I just love that for you. I just absolutely love that you can just have fun as an adult. A lot of times we think we need permission to have fun. I hear it all the time from the guilt. I can't have fun. I had my last guest talking about pleasure and what brings you pleasure. And most people have no idea because they don't do anything. And just yeah. sharing you and your partner dancing on the street. If there is music, we do it. And if there isn't, huh, we do it anyway. Love that for you. That is so <laughs> cool. I absolutely love to hear that and love that for you, especially because you deserve that. I think you really deserve that. Awesome. 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 I always hate this part because we got to wrap up. I always hate this part because the conversation is always so good. But is there anything else, Ray, that you would like to leave with our listeners? Whether it's about the pressure or your job, having fun, anything you would like to leave with us? No, I think, 
living a big life has always been important to me. I often say to people, if I got hit by a bus today and I knew my time was up, I feel like I've lived about five or six lives in one. So I've jammed a lot in and uh, and I, I want to keep living that way. I think that's, I want to keep stretching and I want to keep in some sense self-doubting because that that continues to stretch me and I learn and I grow and develop. So, you know, if I can keep doing that, um, I'm happy. And probably the only thing for uh, anybody listening is that you're welcome to subscribe to my uh, weekly piece of writing, Mindful Motivation. So that's on my website uh, on the front page. There's a, you, You'll find a subscribe button or area there, uh, rayhodge.com.au. Absolutely. And I'll have all of that information in the description box for this show. So anyone who wants to reach out and can get that motivational weekly, I do get it weekly in my in my inbox every week um, about what Ray writes. I mean, I just love, I want to live a big life. I didn't, mm-hmm. it's like, wow, simple. I want to live a full life. I don't want to stop learning. I don't want to give up. I want to be stretched. I want to step out of my comfort zone more. I just love that. Simple. Yeah. Why stop, right? Why stop? As long as we right. have breath, we have hope, we have life. Why stop? Yeah. We are. You said before, I'm really old. I'm like, you're not that old. <laughs> if you're on the street dancing, you're not that old. I don't care what you say. No. You're the, the funny thing is I love getting out with 18 year old guys on the dance floor and copying their copying their moves and they for some reason they actually like showing the old bloke how to do their you know <laughs> it's a lot of fun <laughs> never stop learning never stop growing that's what I'm taking away from this interview I absolutely love it it's okay to not be okay. Yeah, we are talking to, to Ray Hodge, who is someone who has battled depression. Right now is a successful businessman, a successful author. Everything takes discipline, has been to therapy, have come out on the other side. Absolutely love it. Thank you, Ray. Thank you so much for sharing your p- bits and pieces of your journey, because your journey is still in progress and is still continuing but thank you so much for taking the time to share what you have shared with us on this show. I do appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Absolutely. I'm hoping when the new book is released, maybe he'll come back. I don't know. I'll <laughs> ask again. <laughs> I'll have to hunt be ask again. <laughs> maybe he'll say yes and share more in, in depth about what he writes and, um, the new book that that's about to come out. Again, Ray, thank you so much for sharing part of your morning with my evening here in New York and you're in Australia. I appreciate you. I appreciate the time. Like I said before, I've had the pleasure to call this gentleman a friend for almost the last eight years. He knows my journey and he has been an inspiration to me on my journey as well. So I am just so happy to be able to share again, bits and pieces of who you are with my audience. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys, if you have not already liked and subscribed to this YouTube channel, please go ahead and do so. There is so many more other amazing guests. All of my guests are amazing, by the way, that are yet to to sit here and give us their story. Again, this podcast is about inspiring, encouraging, and empowering. And I really hope that you have been able to be encouraged or inspired or empowered by something that was said here today. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Have an amazing day. Thanks again.